welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Heavy Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing the effectiveness of the United Nations, how veto power works and its misuse, and how membership might legitimize regimes around the world. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Brett Shaver, J. Kingham Fellow in International Regulatory Affairs at the Heritage Foundation, and Claudia Rosset, Foreign Policy Fellow with the Independent Women's Forum. Thank you so much, Brett and uh, Claudia, for joining us today. I want to start with you, Claudia. Uh, you know, the United Nations has been always a topic of discussion uh, all over the world. More recently, though, uh, we've been hearing more complaints about the role the United Nations has been able to do, the accomplishments, the lack of accomplishments. How would you describe the United Nations today uh, in terms of how much it's been able to help uh, and fulfill the duties that was created for? The UN has done a lot more to help itself than it has done to help the people around the world it is supposed to be serving. Um, and actually, it's been for decades a problem, uh, but they spend an enormous amount on publicity and they wield a certain amount of clout. So you hear a lot of the good things that they put out, or at least the advertising. But the problem is the UN is just uh, not equipped to deal with a lot of the things that it aspires to or promises to help or solve. Is it a lack of equipment and not uh, the system itself yes. is not uh, uh, set up properly, do you think, Bert? No, it's not a lack of equipment. I mean, the UN has a budget of upwards of 40 billion a year system wide at this point. Uh, and it's got an enormous set of resources to draw on, uh, which mm -hmm. are many of them poured in by the United States. Mm -hmm. No, the problem is the basic DNA is this is a collective. I mean, look, the best comparison I've come up with is Animal Farm. It's a collective of governments and uh, the majority of them are not actually free states. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an opaque bureaucracy. It enjoys a lot of immunities and it rolls out endless promises about how it's going to make the world a better place. Um, there's really no mechanism that clearly holds it to account. Brad, how would you summarize the problems with the United Nations today? Well, I think Claudia hits on a, a very good point here. The UN has an incentive to overpromise. It is in a very competitive environment for resources. Co governments have the ability and the discretion to allocate funding where they want it to be. So they can either send it bilaterally, in the case of the United States, through the U.S. State Department or through the United Nations Agency for International Development. They can go to the World Bank. They can go to the regional development banks. The, the UN is out there, not just the UN system, but also the specialized agencies like UNICEF and World Health Organization, making the case for why government should give them funding rather than other places. And so they tend to overpromise. And mm -hmm. They also tend to point to the, the big successes of the past, for instance, the elimination of smallpox, polio uh, campaign, mm -hmm. and other efforts out there that are legitimate accomplishments. Mm -hmm. But these are accomplishments of many, many years ago and are not necessarily the, the accomplishments that the organization is facing today. For instance, you can look at the response to Ebola in Africa a few years ago. Mm -hmm. The UN response, the World Health Organization response, was absolutely shameful and inept. And it took How other, and why? Uh, basically, it was bureaucratic competition. The African countries did not want to acknowledge the presence of Ebola in the region because that would indicate uh, it would impact perhaps tourism. It would imp in, in, uh, indicate perhaps a failure on the part of national health agencies. It would indicate a failure on the part of the regional organization in the World Health Organization in Africa. And because they were reluctant to identify and uh, promote the scope of the problem, it got worse, far worse, before it got better. And the response was actually external to the UN, the need for the UN General Assembly to identify and call in additional resources rather than relying on the organization that should have been the lead, which was the World Health Organization. And so you see this over and over again, where uh, within the UN peacekeeping operations, within the UN civilian um, personnel, uh, the problem of sexual exploitation and abuse. For, since, for over two decades now, this has been a this big problem. This is happening? 
I mean, I, I haven't. Okay, so t I mean, this is a completely yeah. a new, another like I feel like we're opening Pandora box here. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was uh, abuse uh, scandals within the United Nations. Yes. By whom and where? Well, uh, since I, well, in case your listeners aren't aware of this, um, sec UN peacekeepers, UN civilian employees are sent around the world, mm -hmm. and their mission is to protect populations that are vulnerable for whatever reason. They may mm -hmm. be a humanitarian crisis, there may be a famine, there may be some other problem, and the UN personnel are dispatched to protect and serve those populations. Uh, too often, the peacekeepers and those personnel have become predators themselves. And you see incidences and allegations of sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers and UN civilian personnel for well over 20 years. In fact, uh, um, uh, Prince Zaid, before he was uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, led a report about addressing this issue on, um, uh, almost two decades ago mm -hmm. now and identified it as a big problem and suggested wow. a number of different solutions for it. And one thing that came out of this was that the UN would have a zero tolerance policy for sexual exploitation and abuse. Mm -hmm. Yet we see this problem cropping up again and again and again. Because and they again. did not adopt the yeah. solutions. Well, because it's a problem that they can't discipline their own staff. Mm -hmm. When you talk about peacekeepers, the uh, authority over them, punishing them, holding them to account, is the troop contributing countries. Many of them don't want to hear about the problems, and even when they do hear about the problems, don't follow up. Mm -hmm. In terms of UN civilian personnel, they have immunity. So who actually holds them accountable for, their expo uh, for the, uh, uh, the incidents of criminality and other abuse? It has to be the UN system itself. And the UN system of internal justice and accountability is grossly inadequate, mm -hmm. incredibly slow, and biased in itself. Um, Claudia, I mean, this is, I see you nodding your head. Do you agree with the assessment that Brett is talking about in okay. terms of the, also the sexual allegations and not the United Nations not doing enough to counter this and uh, oh, yes. hold those I mean, people accountable? Is, yeah, Brett is exactly right. This has been a running problem year after year. The UN says it has a policy of zero tolerance for sexual abuse by its personnel, it's, and especially its peacekeepers, who end up in troubled areas where they're supposed to be there to protect people. And over and over, the UN finally began keeping trying to keep statistics on the incidents of sexual abuse, you know, breaking it down by minors, and so on, <laughs> um, and which sort of institutionalized it. I mean, it was useful to see some numbers, although I think it still fell short of the real picture. But these reports just keep coming. And the problem that Brett described is exactly right. It's that there's sort of the UN, there's no real accountability. Again, it goes back to the way the whole system works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's under the, when the UN says that it's passing a resolution or doing something, mm -hmm. uh, the UN actually relies on member states to enforce their own compliance with whatever the UN is doing. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, but that, and what that means is that they actually what it translates into is that the most law abiding states where governments are answerable to their own citizens tend to bear the real burden of whatever the UN requires. And the least law abiding, the rogue states, the despotic regimes, which don't have that kind of accountability back home, sign on to whatever they like and do whatever they please. Mm -hmm. And the result is just terrible. Uh, what, what Brett also said about the UN basically serving as a fig leaf to cover up failure is very true and very dangerous. You know, one instance is Syria, where I remember when the insurrection broke out in 2011, the UN, together with the Arab League, got very busy sending envoys. You know, it was Kofi, Kofi Annan, former mm -hmm. Secretary General, Lakhda Brahimi, and over and over, the word was that, well, you know, this envoy was working on it. Mm -hmm. And it got worse and worse as the world waited for this wonderful diplomatic solution, which didn't arrive. And here we are, hundreds of thousands of people dead later, you know, ISIS, Russia, Syria, mm -hmm. horrible carnage and mess that's been going on. Well, you know, the UN at the beginning said, we're going to solve this. Let us just do our talking. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, that's what the world let them do.
you know, I was going to talk about Syria, and this is definitely going to be a big part because there's so many details about the failure of the United Nations in Syria, if not other things, because there's a lot of reports mm -hmm. about this sort of uh, collaboration, uh, basically, between the United Nations and the Assad regime on so many different occasions. Uh, but I wanted to uh, kind of, uh, you know, I will, I will talk about this a, a little bit later on. Um, there was a point that uh, Claudia mentioned Brett, that uh, it's the collectiveness also, like the system mm -hmm. that's based on collective efforts by different governments, mm -hmm. many of whom are actually uh, corrupted dictatorships, authoritarian. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, now we also see that there's like countries like France, they have a, the right to, for veto, but then, you know, uh, South Africa does not have that same right, mm -hmm. Brazil, India, bigger uh, and, and more, mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, now becoming, uh, you know, stronger powers in the world. Do you think that this is part of why we're not seeing the effectiveness mm -hmm. of this institution? There's a lot to unpack there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's the, a lot. You're right about the membership. When you take a look at the 193 members of the United Nations, um, most of them are not considered politically free by organizations like Freedom House. Most of them are not economically free according to the Index of Economic Freedom, which is produced by the Heritage Foundation. Uh, and so with, when you have a preponderance or a majority of countries in an organization that don't value economic or political freedom, it's hardly surprising that it's not a paragon or a champion of human rights as we would understand it or would hope it to be, as outlined in the charter or as uh, pronounced by various UN officials. And so when you take a look at the work of the Human Rights Council, you take a look at the work of the Third Committee in the UN General Assembly, which is where these uh, human rights issues are discussed, you see a incredible focus on politicized approach to human rights. You see 20 resolutions on Israel and then a handful on the rest of the countries of the world. Mm -hmm. You see one on Syria, one on Iran, one on uh, Burma, and then you see 20 on Israel. And mm -hmm. why is this... Uh, is, does that mean that Israel is, uh, you know, is essentially responsible for four-fifths of the world's human rights uh, mm -hmm. problems? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. But why is it there? Because it's a very popular political item for the G77, uh, the Arab countries, to approach and to highlight for their own political purposes. And that really undermines the objectivity. And then other and, authoritarian yeah. regimes who probably want to hide out what they're doing yeah, of course. by talking about another Of course. Uh, uh, the UN itself country. has talked about how, uh, or no, news reports have discussed how there are maybe as many as a million Uyghurs in Western China that have been put into prison camps and denied their basic human rights and freedoms. China's never been condemned by the UN Human Rights Council. It's mm -hmm. never been condemned by the UN General Assembly for human rights Well, they rights have abuses. the veto. Uh, it, but the th same. neither of those institutions, uh, and the need, veto doesn't apply. Doesn't apply, but they're still not yeah. being condemned. They're not by being the condemned United at all. And it's uh, and you talked about the the UN Security Council. I absolutely agree with you that the Security Council is slow to act and sometimes unable to act because of the veto. But what would happen if you give South Africa a veto or an Egypt a veto, a Nigeria a veto, uh, Mexico or Brazil? What you're doing is compounding the problem. Yes. If you really want the Security Council to be paralyzed and frozen in the face of crises, give a lot more countries seats on the council and give a lot more vetoes mm -hmm. to those countries. Do you think, and I want to hear it from both of you, uh, Brett and uh, Claudia, do you think we should not have the veto in the United mm -hmm. Nations to save it from this paralyzation that we've been seeing over and over again. And I also want to hear from you, Claudia, about what Bert is talking about in terms of some countries being always condemned, always talked about, while other countries doing far worse things uh, have not been uh, mentioned, basically. Mm -hmm. um, look, uh, I'm not sure that, I don't think the problem is the veto per se. I mm -hmm. mean, the the real problem is the UN, actually. <laughs> the problem is the UN as a whole. Yeah. Okay. It, the real problem is that this was, the UN was set up at the end of World War II, and the Security Council reflected basically the victorious powers. Okay, that's how, it, from the beginning, the UN was basically in violation of its own charter in order to do this. The UN charter talks about uh, members being welcome who uphold human dignity and larger freedom and so on. Well, they included Stalin's Soviet Union on the Security Council. 
you know, not only as a member, but with a veto as a permanent member of the Security Council, mm -hmm. uh, which has now been inherited by Russia, which is now run by Putin's, President Putin's dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a problem there where uh, it's, it's much deeper than simply, what do we do about the veto? Um, the real problem is an entire setup which really doesn't correspond well to today's realities. You know, it was a much smaller institution. And the sort of the diplomatic fiction was that this was this great egalitarian institution. The, the real aim was to try and use the powers of the victors in World War II to try and ensure that there would be no more world conflagrations. Mm -hmm. um, my concern, actually, at this point, is that the UN, with the fig leaves, with the promises that don't work, with its sort of pouring resources and making these uh, arrangements that say we're going to fix things that they don't, is actually setting the stage for the next world conflagration. We, we had a long stretch, you know, what, 73 years since the end of World War II, mm -hmm. in which the UN likes to take credit for the peace. I would suggest that it's the Pax Americana, the United States, that mm -hmm. has imposed that. Remember the standoff during the Cold War, mm -hmm. where the UN sort of got into this gridlock on many fronts because the US and the Soviet Union you know, we're at complete loggerheads in the Security mm -hmm. Council. Um, but what is it that actually sort of promoted peace, brought prosperity and so on? It was, um, it was an American democratic system which ended up free, sort of with America being the leader of the free world, the fall of the Soviet Union, the discrediting of communism, thank God, under which... 20, you know, scores of millions died. Mm -hmm. uh, and we now have this institution that really sounds great, you know, but it isn't, that's the problem. And trying to reform the Security Council, these are debates we will have. And mm -hmm. you know, I don't think the UN is going to go away anytime soon. It's deeply embedded in and everything. Then if and it's not going to go away, Claudia, and I want to hear also from you, Brett, is like, what is the solution then for the Security Council where there's the, you know, right to have a veto and even on the issues where hundreds of thousands of people are being in danger, starving to death, uh, I, I, you know, Putin can just decide, well, I'm going to veto this. I don't want them to eat. Mm -hmm. Well, I think... Uh, a couple different things. One is, I don't think we should dismiss the fact that the UN does do good in some places. Uh, the fact that there are tens of millions of refugees around the world and the UN uh, High Commissioner for uh, Refugees is helping address those problems and helping uh, make sure that those populations are fed is a good thing. And we shouldn't dismiss that. That doesn't mean that the institution or the office is uh, not uh, right for improvement or that there can't be uh, focus on uh, getting resources away from perhaps stagnant situations to more urgent crises. Um, but uh, I, I think we should acknowledge up front that the UN is not a completely useless organization, nor is it completely corrupt, nor is it uh, unnecessary. It is necessary and useful, um, not just for the United States, but for a number of different countries mm -hmm. and more importantly for the people it serves around the world. And we should acknowledge that. But it's also a flawed institution, mm -hmm. and we need to address those flaws the best we can. Now, I so you disagree with Claudia on this because Claudia yeah. thinks the whole United Nations as an institution, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Claudia, is just useless. It's not working. It's not functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no point of trying to reform it, I, as you're well, suggesting. I respectfully um, do disagree with Brett, uh, who is immensely knowledgeable on these things, and he's got you know. He's making an argument for which there is a strong case. Um, I think there's a, it's a judgment call that, yes, the UN does do some good. I think on balance, it does harm. In other words, when you net it all out, is it on balance good or bad? And my own, uh, as I see it, the solution at the stage is to, for you know, dealing with the realities that it's there, that it's hooked up to UN member contributions, especially the United States, that there are mm -hmm. huge vested interests in the U.S. and mm -hmm. other developed countries in keeping it going. Mm -hmm. I think the solution is when there is a real problem, 
take it outside the UN, which is pretty much what President Trump did when he uh, sent missiles into Syria in 2017 in response to the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. And what three members of the Security Council, the three permanent members that are democratic countries, did, uh, France, Britain, and the United States, with um, air and missile strikes, again, on Syria's chemical weapons facilities last year. Uh, that was not something where he went through the Security Council because, yeah, Russia would have vetoed it, but um, with, probably with China smiling along. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. he didn't. <laughs> and that's probably the most effective thing that's been done in a, after all the talking and discussion and so on uh, to do something about, for instance, the horrible use of chemical weapons in Syria, which is a danger to the world, you know, mm -hmm. to let that go on. It's monstrous in Syria, and it sets a precedent that you don't want to imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, since Claudia is mentioning Syria again, Syria alone was a major case of why many countries around the world start viewing the United Nations as ineffective and in some, t some uh, cases complicit. Um, we've had um, reports about the Assad regime, for example, uh, benefiting from the aid to Syria. Around 80% of the aid was going directly to the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. There was uh, pictures and videos of the aid being mm -hmm. sold in the streets by members of the militias mm -hmm. who are affiliated with the Assad regime. Uh, some schools opening, for example, in uh, you know mm -hmm. as, uh, Assad regime areas, while the funding was supposed to go to the under siege areas, the liberated areas from the Assad regime. Um, so what is that? Is that corruption? Is that uh, collaboration? I mean, we have new reports, uh, and mm -hmm. I will talk more if yeah. you know you allow me, about the, the um, right now collaboration with the, uh, Assad's frontman uh, and his financial people in terms of uh, you know all of the United Nations personnel being in Damascus and the mm -hmm. Assad regime owned hotel, which is the Four Seasons, mm -hmm. owned by a person who's affiliated directly with Assad, Samir Foz. There's reports about him and the possible um, sanctions against him. What is going on? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is part of the political corruption we were talking about earlier. Uh, this is the UN presence in countries is negotiated with whatever sovereign government is there, no matter how detestable that government may be. You can look at Syria. But you can also look at North Korea. When the UN was in North Korea and providing humanitarian assistance, it did so at, with the cooperation and with the approval of the despotic regime there. When the UN goes into uh, Uganda, for instance, you often, uh, there was an enormous report uh, of, I'm sorry, there was a report of enormous corruption in the refugee uh, effort there where a significant portion of overcounting of refugees was made in order to elevate the amount of money going in there. Mm -hmm. and, and officials were getting kickback from these ghost refugees, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you see this, uh, a situation in South Sudan, where the UN relationship with the government there uh, has, in essence, crippled the ability to actually effectively address the humanitarian uh, crisis. And so you see this over and over and over again. And it is not a, an ideal situation. And you're absolutely right to point out that these despots sometimes benefit from the UN presence there. But there's also the opposite side of things. You have a very real humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. and a population that is starving, people that are suffering, and the UN is the, the least objectionable vehicle for getting assistance to them. So it's a, for, in my opinion, it's a call not to throw out everything and abandon these people to the circumstances, but to ride rough and hard on top of the UN to make sure that it is doing things effectively, that it's tracking this money, and that the least amount possible is being diverted to these nefarious purposes. Claudia, I want to redirect this to you because, I mean, there were instances when the UN was not, you know, allowed to go into these neighborhoods mm -hmm. where people were under siege, they were starving, and then when the aid would de be delivered, there was um, reports about poisoning because the food and the aid was expired. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are we talking about here? Is this a political corruption, as Brad just point out, pointed out? Well, uh, the corruption and collaboration are not mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. and the UN has a record of doing mm -hmm. both. Uh, 
with despotic mm -hmm. regimes. Um, you know, <clears throat> the uh, the whole the, oil for food situation was an example of this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going. Yeah, the program right. in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in Iraq, you will mm -hmm. remember Iraq, Saddam Hussein was under UN sanctions, and the UN set up mm -hmm. this massive relief program, mm -hmm. which it assured the world was going to oversee Saddam Hussein's oil sales and then bring relief mm -hmm. with the money into Iraq for the people. And that turned out to be, my, it was an extravaganza of global corruption so spectacular. I mean, I spent years digging into stories on that. It mm -hmm. was unbelievable. It, uh, and one of the, of course, one of the hubs where this was going on at the time was Syria. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the corridors for you kick, for kickback deals that were done under the aegis of the UN with the UN looking on, they certainly had to know that there was a huge problem there. And not only nodding along and letting it happen, but telling the world that it was a well-run, well-audited, thoroughly overseen program. And the only reason we came to see the degree of corruption and the same Assad family you were talking about with the hotel, you sort of with the hotel, was involved in that nest of kickbacks, attempted missile deals with North Korea, it went on and on, mm -hmm. weapons imports from Russia and Belarus, um, that, uh, that is that is how it tends to happen when the UN goes into a place saying we're going to bring humanitarian aid and or we're going to offer this oversight or relief. And the reason for that, it's it, this isn't random. It Again, it's in the DNA. Part of the problem is the UN operates with immunity, and it operates across borders. It's not subject to any one jurisdiction. So you can get away with a lot at the UN. Um, if I may, on one more front, the example that Brett cited of North Korea, which came to be known, it was a 2007 scandal that came to be known as Cash for Kim, the father, Kim being Kim Jong-il, the father of the current dictator. Uh, and that was, in that instance, what was discovered thanks to a whistleblower, the UN then severed his employment, mm -hmm. uh, is that the UN Development Program Office in North Korea, which was the, was the flagship was an agency, was busy bringing in items it was handing over to the North Korean government that were dual use. In other words, they could be used for military purposes, especially missile development. And uh, it was giving, it was allowing the North Korean staff which in North Korea is entirely controlled by the totalitarian regime, mm -hmm. to handle the checkbook, the UN bank accounts. The, again, that turned, mm -hmm. it was discovered that the UN office in Pyongyang was keeping counterfeit US $100 banknotes in its office safe. You know, I remember... So you know, he was using the United States. Nations to buy cut uh, sanctions against his regime also? Could that be what was happening? Uh, well, yes. I mean, the thing is, the UN has the ability to import uh, under UN immunities, and that was exactly what was happening. The UN had become. What a would you like to add to that, Brad? Oh, it's just there are there are degrees of this problem, right? North Korea is an extreme example where you basically cannot do anything in the country without the uh, approval and oversight of the despotic regime there. Mm -hmm. Then there are situations where the governments are basically inept mm -hmm. and dysfunctional and corruption arises in terms of allowing access or to facilitate the access to these materials. One situation uh, is within the authority of the UN. They understand that everything going in there is either going to benefit the government directly or indirectly and they shouldn't be engaging in that kind of an assistance program. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the other situation where it's chaotic, you have a suffering population and the UN wants to go in there and help it, and they may have some corruption that deals with it. And that's where the governance of the member states comes into play. And they may have to make sure that the corruption is minimized, knowing full well that you're never going to get it out 100%, mm -hmm. but that the calculation of the United States, other countries that are contributing the funds for that assistance, is that we're going to be helping more people than we're going to be doing harm by facilitating this corruption. And it's never a perfect situation, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we can't always aspire to make it better. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need to be uh, holding things to account.
And North Korea, frankly, we're just enabling the despotic regime by providing the assistance there because everything goes through the government and goes, and we know the priority and the hierarchy of what is important yeah. to that government. It is the, the elites, yeah. the military, and the people at the bottom. And the people at the bottom are benefiting almost Nothing. to no extent. I mean, if we're talking about Syria and we're talking about 80% mm -hmm. going to the Assad regime that we know about, this mm -hmm. is a very, very high yeah, level, it's a huge level of, of uh, corruption right there and yeah. there because this is all goes to the pockets of the regime itself. Um, I want to actually talk about the United States and where does it mm -hmm. stand. Now we know that uh, Trump's administration is already very skeptical mm -hmm. of the United Nations. John Bolton, when he was uh, mm -hmm. the you know, special envoy to the United Nations, he said it, that the, if you take out a few floors of this building, nothing will change mm -hmm. in the world. Um, right now we have Heather mm -hmm. Narrett. She's the new nominee. She's going to be, she was appointed to become um, the ambassador to the United Nations. How do you view uh, this administration's uh, you know, mm -hmm. actions and possible uh, decisions on the United Nations? We already know that they've cut out some of the funding mm -hmm. to programs different programs within the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I want to hear from both of you. Uh, well, there, again, there's a, a lot to unpack there. Uh, and I think Ambassador Bolton's statement that you could take out 10 floors, um, and that was interpreted as sort of being an assault on the, on the structural integrity of the building or on the staff itself. What he's talking about is that the, the UN does a lot of things that are not necessarily uh, central to its mission, its purpose, mm -hmm. uh, that there's a lot of duplication and overlap within the organization, and that is absolutely true. Take, for instance, the economic commissions. There's one for Europe, there's mm -hmm. one for a Asia, there's one for the uh, Western Asia, there's one for Africa, there's one for Latin America and the, Car and the Caribbean. And together, these economic commissions consume about half a billion dollars in the UN budget. There are over 2,000 employees there. And basically, they're entirely duplicative. They're advisory organizations that provide economic advice to the regions that they're uh, covering, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a World Bank. We exactly. have regional economic... Uh, the economy have, is becoming one. Yeah, we have regional banks, uh, economic, uh, world uh, development banks. We have the IMF. We have a huge number. We have the OECD. We have bilateral development agencies. All of these organizations not only provide similar advice, but they also provide money. The UN doesn't really provide a whole lot of money for these purposes. It's just a talk shop there. And essentially what it is is a jobs program for people from the region. I don't know about you, but Europe seems pretty developed to me. What the, the notion that we have an economic commission for Europe is ludicrous at this point. Now, no, it was set up a long time ago, mm -hmm. but I think that's pretty much a mission accomplished situation at this point. Mm -hmm. And so we should be talking about how do we narrow the UN down? How do we focus it on those areas where it provides a unique contribution to the world community or to addressing problems that other institutions cannot focus on. And the number of those is far less than what we see today. And this is the administration's uh, basically the, its mm -hmm. priority right now. It's to kind of cut down on this extra waste yeah. of spending. It, there's, a, there's a lot of areas where I think the UN could refocus existing resources or cut resources to, that could be used more effectively somewhere else. And that has been a priority of the United States, not just under this administration, but the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, so the Reagan administration, trying. all the way back. And the problem <laughs> is that in the UN system, um, you, you mentioned the veto. Well, the budget isn't a, isn't a veto situation. It's uh, approved by two-thirds of the member states. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that the G77, which has uh, the group of 77, which is developing countries plus China, mm -hmm. uh, has enough members among its own membership to approve the budget above, over the objections of the United States. Uh -huh. But the United States pays twice the amount that the G77 does for the budget. Mm -hmm. So you have a discrepancy between the contributions and the countries that are paying for the bills mm -hmm. and the countries that are deciding the bills. And it, it's an it's incredibly uh, difficult situation to actually focus uh, the reform effort and focus the reallocation of resources when the countries that have the votes aren't really uh, providing the funding. Mm -hmm. so they have no skin in the game. So, so they have, yeah, they, they can have, make the decisions on wrong. behalf of those who are actually investing. Yeah. What do you think, Claudia? Yeah, uh, well, let's see. I actually think uh, the world might be better off if you got rid of most of the time. <laughs> I, I don't mean this in any literal way, but metaphorically speaking, uh, without a lot of what the UN does. The problem being, you know, as Brett was saying, a lot of things date back to the last century and an era when it was very popular to have these 
development banks, aid programs were thought necessary. You know, they were trying to sort of put the world to, back together after World War II. And the real force for progress in these things and free markets where they've turned up and uh, the progress of genuine democracy, which is tough to create and keep going, but where that takes some real root. And the UN has sort of continued to expand what I actually think of as a giant agenda for central planning. It sets out these goals, sustainable development goals. In fact, the word sustainable at the United Nations, I, I, I don't even know what it means anymore. It was tacked to onto everything. Not everything needs to be sustainable. Some things need to change in the US, the UN, the United Nations, I think is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but they set out all these goals, and then they what that allows them to do, this is partly a fundraising mechanism, because that's a great deal of what drives the UN. And what Brett was just describing is exactly right. Uh, the money comes in from one direction, and a lot of it is spent by other actors. It's, a, in a sense, an enormous entitlement program that benefits, I think, way too much some of the worst actors on the planet. The problem you're talking about right now with Assad in Syria would be piece of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, my own prescription there would be, okay, you don't need to get rid of the United Nations, but reduce it to nothing but a talking shop. In fact, I've often thought a gymnasium in Novosibirsk would serve just fine, or somewhere in rural America if they'll have it. Uh, not this enormously, lavishly funded huge outfit, you know, operating with basically what's a neo-colonial global empire. It's, it's very it's ironic. The <laughs> UN, which has been against colonialism for decades, mm -hmm. has in some way, I mean, it began as an outfit where countries would send envoys to the UN. We now have a situation which the UN basically sends relays of envoys to countries. It mm -hmm. <laughs> goes, goes both ways. And it's all on this premise, again, that this is going to do good things. Well, again, as Brett described, the UN works with and through governments in the main. What are the countries where things are, where you see the most trouble as a rule? They are the world's worst dictatorships. They're the, why are people poor in country, some countries and rich in others? Oh, South okay. North Korea being yes. a great example. The UN sends aid, help, and effectively provides legitimacy to um, the worst and so that, that's that's the big problem with yeah. this whole setup. What do you think this administration is prepared to do now to uh, try to change things? And is it actually committed to mm -hmm. making these reforms that are needed uh, to fix this situation, mm -hmm. this uh, waste of money and uselessness, basically, of this mm -hmm. uh, very old and prestigious uh, organization mm -hmm. in the world? Well, you're, this administration uh, has taken a few steps to try and uh, assess whether U.S. contributions are uh, meeting up with U.S. Uh, foreign policy priorities. And you see uh, decisions being made that previous administrations did not make. For instance, mm -hmm. the decision to finally pull out of UNESCO. The U.S. Mm -hmm. had not been funding UNESCO since 2011. We have over half a billion dollars in arrears to UNESCO at this point. This administration made the diplomatic um, conclusion that it's better to stop the bleeding and get out of this institution mm -hmm. if we're not going to be funding it than to stay in to provide a diplomatic cover cover and for, what, for the Yes, what's the, the problems with the UNESCO? Because people sure. need to know, that especially that this is going to be aired yeah. in the Middle East. Okay. Or, yeah. uh, it's the United Nations Education, Cultural, and Scientific Organization. And education, scientific, and cultural organization. And essentially, it's a talking shop, like much mm -hmm. of the UN is. Uh, mm -hmm. It passes resolutions on historical uh, sites of significance. Um, and mm -hmm. it also uh, passes uh, resolutions on educational materials and so forth. Uh, the United States was a member of UNESCO from the beginning. It was one of the countries that was instrumental in its formation. Uh, it became a corrupt institution. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan pulled the United States out in 1984 uh, mm -hmm. for a number of different reasons, including mismanagement, but also because of that organization's hostility to freedom of the press and free speech. Mm -hmm. um, the United States went back in the organization in 2003, uh, partially because of some managerial reforms that were improved over the 
uh, the previous um, 19 years, mm -hmm. but also because the United States was getting a lot of criticism for the Iraq war at the time, and it saw this as a diplomatic outreach or a fig, uh, olive mm -hmm. branch to, mm -hmm. uh, to show that the United States was not uh, unsupportive of the UN more broadly. Since uh, then, the organization has granted the Palestinians full membership, and mm -hmm. under U.S. law, we cannot give contributions or any funding to any organization that accords the Palestinians the same membership status as other member states. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we haven't paid any money to it mm -hmm. since 2011. In the Obama administration, rather than taking the tough decision to pull out, they just kept accruing bills and debts but not years, paying. But not paying. Not paying anything. And, exactly. And not making the decision to pull out. This administration pulled out. Mm -hmm. uh, we also stopped. What about UNRWA? Uh, we also stopped funding uh, UNRWA mm -hmm. this year, because the Palestinians uh, were not being uh, uh, cooperative in the peace negotiations. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the United States support for UNRWA. We've provided over $6 billion to UNRWA since 1950. Six billion. And we've provided over $5 billion in bilateral assistance to the Palestinians since uh, over the past two decades. Mm -hmm. So the, the United States commitment financially and diplomatically to the Palestinians has been enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only expectation was that they would enter into good faith negotiations with Israel for mm -hmm. a lasting peace that would end up with a mutual rec recognition. The Palestinians haven't been willing to do that. Mm -hmm. They've avoided any kind of uh, deal and negotiation that the Israelis have offered, including some that were enormously um, tilted toward the Palestinian requests mm -hmm. and demands. Uh, and instead, they've been uh, pursuing recognition and a uh, international um, uh, membership in international organizations, mm -hmm. absent any serious negotiations. The, mm -hmm. This administration said, if you're not going to be an honest partner in these peace negotiations and earn them with good faith, then we're not going to continue to fund both UNRWA or your uh, government bilaterally through the assistance that we mm -hmm. have in the past. If you do enter into those uh, negotiations in good faith, then we're perfectly willing to continue that support. The Palestinians have chosen not to. Yeah. The United States is not anti-Palestinian by any means. The United States is anti-terrorism. The United States is anti threats to annihilate a legitimate nation state, which is what comes out of Hamas, the terrorist group that rules Gaza. And uh, one of the great problems with UNRWA, money is fungible. UNRWA was basically serving as the sort of uh, helping to fund and run the infrastructure of Gaza, freeing up Hamas and its terrorist cohorts there to do things like dig tunnels under the border into Israel, to uh, import weapons, to send rockets, to, to do all the things that actually are sort of violent attacks on the Israelis, threats against them, mm -hmm. and, and the United States. And the problem, again, at the UN is, you know, former Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, the late Jean Kirkpatrick, wrote a terrific article about this way back, I don't know, about a ago where she talked about how the Palestinians were using the United Nations as a vehicle to try and legitimize behavior that was simply not what the civilized world should be contemplating. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's going on with the kind of charge that, oh, cutting funding to UNRWA is uh, anti-Palestinian. It is not. Actually, one can have a certain sympathy for the population, for the Palestinians who have been told over and over by the United Nations that they are the great victims, that they will someday, if they just stick with this UN program, get all sorts of restitution, that they, who live on the dole, basically, thanks to the United Nations, couldn't bring it sort of with UNRWA and the U.S. contributions that Brett was just citing, mm -hmm. and uh, who, who actually could be living much better lives if that stopped being the central obsession. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the problems there is the UN itself does well out of these programs. It collects effectively commissions for running them. It's huge patronage. You know, there are thousands and thousands of jobs. Every time the UN gins up something more like this, there's more patronage and turf. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that's what, that's what the UN is really about. Mm -hmm. So that, 
I think is really the way to understand this. Mm -hmm. What was you know, what was being funded with UNRWA? We were paying for the education and the sewers so that the terrorists running this enclave could dig dig attack tunnels and pay so for weapons. So basically, what you're saying is that the billions of dollars that the United States have put in the UNRWA didn't provide solutions for the Palestinians, didn't make their life better, did not uh, help their education, uh, because we see a stagnation basically in the situation mm -hmm. on the ground, the rule of some uh, terrorist organizations like Hamas. Uh, and so on and so forth. Do you agree with this assessment? Well, it's, right. yeah, it's perpetuated the problem. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it, Claudia's right about that. If you look at UNRWA, it was set up as a temporary agency over 60 years ago. That's a heck of a lot of temporary agency yeah. to be doing. And the purpose. What of, do you need as an alternative? Well, then? well here, here's the thing. Um, the purpose of UNRWA was to provide temporary assistance to address a temporary crisis. The mm -hmm. I, the outcome is to have a lasting peace between the Palestinians, the Israelis, that both mutually recognize each other's right to, uh, mm -hmm. to exist and to govern themselves. Um, and we haven't seen the progress. Mm -hmm. And largely it's because of an unwillingness by a number of Arab governments and the Palestinians to recognize Israel's right to exist. Mm -hmm. and, the, the, and you see this not just with the Palestinians, but with a number of different uh, crises around the world. The United, States, the United Nations has had a UN operation in Kashmir since 1949. Mm -hmm. The UN has had a UN a peacekeeping operation, UNSO, in the Middle East since 1948. It's been in Cyprus since 1964. Mm -hmm. It's been in Western Sahara since 1991. It's been in Lebanon since 1978. These are long, festering crises, and the UN presence there clearly is not leading toward a culmination or a resolution of the problem. Mm -hmm. In some cases, maybe the UN presence is giving everybody an excuse not to resolve the problem because it gives them a convenient way to uh, alleviate the worst. And, That's it. and so we need to restore the focus of that organization on resolving conflicts, not just preventing uh, the worst um, impacts of an unstable situation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, lastly, you know that uh, right now we have Heather that's going to uh, start her job. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Nikki Haley was praised a lot for mm -hmm. her outstanding performance and work that she has done uh, in the United Nations. Do you think Heather will uh, fill uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, big uh, shoe, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, her, her mm -hmm. new role? Uh, as you said, oh, uh, Nikki, talking, Ambassador Haley um, left enormously big shoes to fill, and she is going to have... Uh, I think a great deal of expectations on her, uh, but the, she obviously has the, the confidence of the president who uh, is going to nominate her for that position. I think people are underestimating her foreign policy knowledge in acumen. Heather? Heather. Heather yes. Nauer, because of the situation that she's been in for almost two years now. She has been the point person defending this administration's foreign policy to the U.S. press and to the foreign press. I'd say that she's got an ideal position to see both the evolution and the direction that it's going and why they have arrived at the policies that they have. And I think that is an asset and will be an asset in New York, where one of the primary responsibilities of that job is not to just raise your hand and vote on this, that, or the other, but to approach the representatives of other governments mm -hmm. and explain why the U.S. is doing what it's doing, mm -hmm. explain to them how that can be mutually beneficial and also warn potential adversaries of the consequences for their actions. And in that role, I think she's, her experience over the past two years is going to be an invaluable asset. What do you think, Claudio? I agree with Brett. And I think um, trying to actually reform the UN sort of in depth is, I think of it as trying to move a tsunami of mud with a spoon. It's just very hard because whatever you do, the UN will do an end run. Um, but what Ambassador Haley did that stood out so brilliantly was over and over, as Brett said, she called out what was really going on and said, you know, she asked them to deal with sensible ways in the real world, mm -hmm. and uh, which is unusual at the United Nations. And to do that, an American ambassador needs the real backing of the president. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that enabled Ambassador Haley to do as well as she did is that President Trump did stand behind her. And when the U.S. pulled out of, you know, 
the Human Rights Council, UNESCO, cut funding to UNRWA and so on, as Brett just laid out, uh, the White House was there. They weren't undercutting her on these things. So if President Trump continues to be behind that approach to the UN, I think Heather Nauer has a, assuming she's confirmed, has a good chance to do quite a good job. And I think Nikki Haley also did a very nice job of showing how it can be done. Uh, there was something about that mm -hmm. the <laughs> Southern charm combined with saying these very steely things, including, for instance, you know, some of the Security Council meetings where she was speaking to the Russians about chemical weapons in Syria mm -hmm. and was speaking no words, that she managed to be, and this to my mind, this is the real diplomatic art, uh, which is not often carried out at the UN. Yes. She managed to speak great sense and some of it highly insulting with reason mm -hmm. to her interlocutors mm -hmm. and at the same time be quite civil in her manner. Mm -hmm. And I think Heather Nauert has that as a terrific example. Yeah, we wish her the best of luck. We've had her on uh, the show before and definitely would love to you know, see her confirmed and see her uh, carry on uh, in this uh, very important mission. I want to thank you both for joining me today. This conversation, I mean, I still had a list of questions that I could mm -hmm. not ask you because we're out of time, but I would love to have you again in the future mm -hmm. and talk more about this issue and other issues. Be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. To be here. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.